Chapter 8 Hale 693402 Early in December, when it was too early to start whooping it up for Christmas and too late to plan anything for Thanksgiving, me and Dink Fowler and Amos Finch were asked to join a club that some other boys from our school were starting. Our club was called 693402. We called it that because it sounded official and kind of mysterious like a code. Actually, that number had no meaning whatsoever, and those that weren't in the club spent a good many painful hours trying to figure out what 693402 could mean. We planned it that way. Clint Harker, who was in 8th grade, was the one who thought of it. Me and Dink and Amos were the only ones from our grade who were asked to join. It didn't hurt our standing any, either. We met after school on Wednesdays in a field right next to school, but hidden from any noisy teachers by several big clumps of sumac bushes. Me and Dink and Amos were called bird dogs because we were youngest and supposed to be the worst stinkers. Eighth graders were called hounds, which was a whole lot better than bird dogs, but not near so good as the club of officers who were called emperors. We bird dogs always got the dirty jobs, no matter what it was, and we had to mind the hounds and emperors and do what they told us to, or we'd get kicked out of the club. We couldn't even come into the meetings until all the emperors and hounds had taken their seats. Let the bird dogs enter, yelled Myron Webster, who was chief assassin. That meant he could pick on us bird dogs whenever he felt like. He felt like it a lot, too. We three came in, solemn as saints, and sat down on the ground, filling in the weakest spots in the circle around the chief assassin and Clint Harker, who was president. Bird dogs all present and accounted for, sir chief assassin, said Dink gravely. Dink was the king, was the king of... Dink was the kind of king of us bird dogs. Allah permit that your guts not rot on the desert, prayed the Sir Chief Assassin, who had written the dialogue for these meetings himself. All members present or accounted for, Holy President, Myron said to Clint. He got down on his knees and bowed until Clint touched him on the nose with the little finger of his right hand. That meant Myron could stand up again, which he did immediately. Tell all six nine three four o twos to rise for the oath, commanded Clint. Rise, emperors, rise, hounds, rise, bird dogs, for the oath of the clan, said Myron, like he was leading a revival or something. Then we all stood up and held our two fists up, even with our eyes, and looked at them. We didn't just look at our fists, we were supposed to stare at them. Our right fist to the blood of our enemy, our left fist to eternal victory, we all said together, like the Pledge of Allegiance. We didn't have any enemies for our right fists yet, but we expected some at any time. Then we sat back down on the ground. What's new? Clint asked Myron. Oh, nothing, Myron answered. It's just Wednesday. That's the day we're supposed to meet. Don't we have anything to talk about? said Clint. Nope. Amos Finch paid his dues, and that's all we talked about at the last meeting. Unless you've thought up something for the bird dogs to do. They want to try and become hounds and have to do something to prove themselves worthy, said Myron. I guess if we'd had, if we'd had, had some other kind of business to attend to, the whole thing never would have come up. But since we didn't have any more business, we bird dogs caught it head on. Yeah, grinned Clint. I remember now. They have to do something brave before they can become hounds, don't they? Yep, said Myron. Got any ideas? I sure do, said Clint. Rise, bird dogs, and hear the words of your leader. We bird dogs all rose, like we were on wires or something. On the eighth day of this month, when the moon is at its fullest, you three will proceed to the old Stapleton farmhouse at midnight, and once there, you will go directly to the attic of the house, where, you will remember, old man Stapleton was found hanging from a rafter by his neck, with his tongue stuck out of his mouth in death. He didn't have to say that last part. Just to mention the old Stapleton place gave me the screaming willies, and the way Clint talked about it made me want to forget all about ever becoming a hound. When you get there, you will rip loose one of the old swallow's nests up in the attic, and with a jackknife, you will prick your fingers, and all three of you will spill your blood into that swallow's nest. Then you will return to your homes and bring the nest with you to the next meeting to prove you actually did it. Do you understand?
Clint looked up and down all three of us, just daring anyone to whine about what we had to do. We understand, O oh holy president, and it shall be done, said that jerk, Dink. The oath, then, said Clint, our right fist to the blood of our enemy, our left fist to eternal victory, everybody sang out. We three bird dogs left together. Later, after it was all over, I found out what the rest of 693402 did after we'd gone. They made plans to rig our assignment on us, as you will see. But we didn't know anything about it at the time. The 8th was Saturday, and it was on us before we knew it. Amos had gotten permission to spend the night at Dink's house. Dink's parents were in Queenston for the weekend, but his older sister was supposed to be looking after him and Amos. By eleven o'clock that night, she was snoring like a freight train on an uphill climb, and they took off. I had a little more trouble than that. Caleb had sensed that something was up, and he stuck to me like flypaper in a windstorm. I snuck up to bed while he was still fighting the idea, though, and pretended to be asleep when he came in. I lay there nervously and waited for the house to quiet down. In a little while, I heard Papa switch off the light in his and Mama's room. Callie's room was downstairs, so I didn't have to worry about her. I waited a few more minutes and then slowly sat up in bed. Where are you going, bud? whispered Caleb. Pulling up my blanket, you mind? Oh, no, go right ahead. Thanks, I replied. It worried me that Caleb was so jumpy. I had slipped into bed with my clothes on so I could slip out quietly without him waking up. But if he didn't drop up to sleep soon, I'd be too late to meet Dick and Dink and Amos. At last, his breathing came more evenly, and he seemed to be asleep. I carried my shoes and jacket over to the window, unlatched the storm window, and climbed out onto the porch roof and down my oak tree. Dink and Amos were waiting for me beside the lumber yard fence. Man, it's a cold one, muttered Dink as we left. You got that flashlight, bud? Yeah, I've got it all right, I said. I got the jackknife, too, added Amos. Stapleton's old farmhouse stood out of town about a mile or so, along an old dirt road that nobody used anymore. Old man Stapleton had been a prosperous merchant in the good old days of Harleyville, when the railroad had made it a lot more important city than it is today. Stapleton's wife and daughter had both died of the scarlet fever one winter, and they had found the old man about a week later hanging up there in the attic, swinging back and forth with the breeze that blew in from under the eaves. All the trees and bushes had grown up around the old place, and it had gradually earned the title of being haunted. It was the roosting place for all the swallows in Ogano County. The paint was all peeling off the old boards, and the porch floor was giving way the last time I'd been out there, which was high noon one summer day on our way to the creek. Other than for good old 693402, you wouldn't have gotten me near that place at night for love, money, or applesauce. The night was still and cold, with a bright moon that made you shiver every time you looked at it. The trees and bushes were so quiet it was like they were frozen stiff, and whenever you talked or breathed, a great cloud of white smoke would come out of your mouth. When we turned on to the little lane that ran down to the Stapleton place, we could see the old buildings, dark shadows in the broken patches of moonlight. It was quiet as a coffin and twice as scary. Me and Amos huddled on either side of Dink. You might say we tried to surround him. Well, this kind of thing never seemed to bother Dink, and me and Amos were counting on him for a good bit of our courage. We crouched down and looked at the old farmhouse. It was a two-story frame building that had once must have been the rage of the country. A wide front porch ran the whole length of the place, and the high-pitched roof reminded us of the big attic that was once up there, and what had been found inside once so long ago. "'The heck with it,' whispered Amos. "'Let's start our own club.' "'Shh!' ordered Dink. "'What do you mean? Let those guys know we're chicken-livered? Not me!' Whatever Dink decided, I knew he spoke for all three of us. Me and Amos were just about to leave him and go back down the dark road by ourselves. "'I can't tell if the front door is still on or not,' mused Dink. "'It is,' I answered him. "'It's in the shadows. "'But that porch floor is giving way with termites.' "'Better find another way in, then,' Dink muttered. "'He thought about this for a minute. "'Tell you what, let's shinny up that old tree beside the house. "'We can get in through the second-story window easy from there. "'We'll stick to the scrub and bushes.' And let's keep it quiet. Yeah, said Amos, except for my teeth chattering and my knees knocking. 
His face looked about the color of the moon, and I guess mine did too. Inside of me, I was so scared I roared with noise, and yet on the outside, you couldn't have heard me or any of us move across that yard and up that tree, unless you had special senses. Dink climbed right up and made it through the window without a sound. The glass had all been broken out long ago, so we didn't have to worry about getting cut. Amos followed Dink up the tree and I wasn't far behind. Carefully, we climbed over the sill and stood inside a dark, moldy-smelling old building. I can't see anything, complained Amos. Where are we? Must be a bedroom, suggested Dink. Let's all just stand here for a minute and let our eyes get used to the dark. I blinked a few times and waited for something to happen. It did. Suddenly, Amos began to gurgle deep down in his throat. His face seemed to glow sickly in the darkness. What is it? I whispered. He couldn't or didn't answer. You just pointed to the window. Me and Dink turned to look. Just even with the bedroom window was a fork in the main branches of the tree. Crouching there was a dark shadow. The moonlight shone down through the branches on a small, scowling face that peered into the darkness where we stood. It's, it's, it's Stapleton's little girl, moaned Amos, finding his voice at last. The one that died of scarlet fever. She doesn't want us here. No, it ain't, said Dink disgustedly. He turned to me. It's your little brother. He must have followed us. Caleb, said Amos. That's the one, sighed Dink. Come on, we better haul him in before he falls out of that tree on his head or something. But the club, I whispered, the club secrets. He'll find out our mission and we'll all get kicked out. Can't help it now, said Dink. He leaned out the window and for a minute I thought Caleb was going over backwards. That you, bud? He demanded quietly. I can't see you, it's so dark. Is that you? No, it ain't, bud, snarled Dink. Now take my arm and climb in here before you fall. Oh, hi, Dink, said Caleb, all smiles. He crawled in beside us. Hello, Amos. Hi, bud. When I get home, I started to say, but Caleb interrupted me. Oh, I won't tell anybody honest. I'll even help, he pleaded. What do we do? Oh, shut up and let's get going, said Dink. We tiptoed slowly out of the room and into the hall. Watch where you walk and try to find a way to the attic, commanded Dink. Since he seemed to know what she was doing, we did what he said. There she is, hissed Caleb. With the moonlight that shined in through the windows, we could see him pointing at a dark spot on the hall ceiling. It's a trap door, he explained. We got one like that at our house. Me and Dink and Amos looked at Caleb with surprised respect. So far, everything had gone okay, and Caleb's arrival had somehow calmed us down some. I was just beginning to feel like I might come out of this alive when, when, when we heard this noise. It seemed to come from down underneath us somewhere, but I might have been wrong. What made it so bad was it was the noise somebody might make when they're choking. It's old man Stapleton, moaned Amos. He's up there swinging from a rafter waiting for somebody to cut him down. Shh, ordered Dink. I was so scared I could not have said persimmon pie, and Caleb seemed paralyzed. We stood there, frozen, and listened for a long time. The house was as quiet as a schoolyard on the 4th of July. Once we thought we heard a board squeak downstairs, and another time, something like a faraway belch. It's just a possum or something, reasoned Dink. He's rooting away down there for something. He acted like he heard noises like that every day. You ever heard a possum belch? inquired Amos. No, admitted Dink. But I guess they do, when there isn't anybody around. Well, there isn't going to be anybody around the next time he does that, warned Amos. Let's go, said Ding. We've come this far. We can't quit now. I'll never know where he got the strength or the nerve, but Dink jumped up and got his hands over the edge of that opening to the attic. Then he pulled himself the rest of the way up and disappeared into the blackness. A rustling noise filtered down from the opening. Me and Caleb and Amos just looked at each other. Sst! came a noise from over our heads. Grab my arm! I'll help you up! We could just barely make out Dink's face in the great cave above us. Go ahead, Amos, he said politely. After you, bud, he replied. When I swung myself up into the attic, I wasn't sure I was sure I didn't want to stay. The boards were knocked out on one end. 
and outlined against the bright moonlight was something that looked like a human body hanging there. Let go of my arm, I ordered Dink. I'm getting out of here. Hold on, said Dink. Can't you see it? You bet your life I see it, I said. I've seen it enough already to last me the rest of my life, however long that is. It's just a scarecrow. Myron and Clint must have swiped it out of somebody's cornfield and hung it up here to scare us, explained Dink. It is, I asked. Well, they sure succeeded. Hey, don't leave us down here, Amos was whispering, and we helped him and Caleb up. They reacted about the same way I had, until Dink explained. And do you know what else, Dink continued. I'd be afraid to guess, said Amos. I think, said Dink, that those noises we heard was the rest of 693402 hiding downstairs to jump us when we came in through the front door. That's where they expected us, and they didn't see or hear us come in by that window. You really think so, I asked? Sure, that's it. I should have guessed it before, said my smart friend Dink. What do we do, asked Amos. I'll tell you what we do, said Dink. We'll fix those hounds and emperors good, since they don't know we're here. How will we do that, I asked. Well, to start with, let's get at them through the chimney. There's some bricks missing, and we can drop things down the flue so they'll make a big racket down in the living room. They're probably all standing there waiting for us to get here. That ought to get some action. We forgot about being scared once we knew there was a chance to make our fellow members feel the same way we had. We searched the attic and found a few bricks and some small chunks of 4 by 8 Dink poked the bricks down the hole in the flue and let them go. There must have been bottles or something in that fireplace because we heard the crash all the way up in the attic. And that's not all we heard. Somebody downstairs just plain leaned back and hollered like death was pulling at his innards. Cripes, giggled Dink. Listen to them, will you? They're scared silly. In a minute, we heard steps on the stairs. Fast steps. And then they were up on the second floor, running around from room to room like crazy people. The four of us sat quietly on the edge of the trap door and chuckled silently. Once in a while, somebody would zip by right underneath us without even looking, thinking of looking up. Dink was laughing so hard and having such a hard time staying quiet that the tears just rolled down his cheeks. <laughs> just wait till we see those guys at next Wednesday's meeting, he whispered. Just wait. Amos had been watching the vague figures tear around beneath us. Suddenly, he held up his hand for us to be quiet. Two of them had stopped right below us and were talking. Well, something had to make that racket. It didn't just happen, Harry, said a deep voice. I know, I know, but we've looked through this whole house. Whatever it was ain't here no more. Let's check the cellar again, Harry. We went through there pretty fast the first time. And then the two of them hurried down the stairs. Amos looked at us. He was very pale again. We listened to the footsteps die away. Uh, say, fellers, said Amos weakly, we haven't got anybody in our club named Harry. Those were two grown men. They looked like railroad tramps to me. We stared at each other. That weak feeling in my belly was back again, only worse. What'll we do? I gulped. I'm the youngest, volunteered Caleb, like he was supposed to be saved first. We've got to get out, whispered Dink. I think he was scared too this time. They'd fix us good for scaring them if they caught us. They were going to the cellar, said Amos suddenly. We've got to get down now if we want to get away. We've got to go quick, before they finish looking in the cellar and come back upstairs. We didn't waste any time getting out of that attic, but we were quiet about it. We tiptoed down the hall and followed right behind Dink as he carefully made his way down the creaky steps. We could hear the voices of the two men down in the cellar, cussing each other and trying hard to find out what had scared them. At the bottom of the stairs, we could see Freedom, right outside the front door, bathed in clear, liquid moonlight. We gathered our strength to make the sprint through the yard and on back to Dink's house. Just then, around the corner of the hall, not five feet from where we crouched on the stairs, came a fat old man with whiskers all over his face. He looked at us like he couldn't believe what he saw. Go like the devil, shouted Dink, diving out the door with the three of us half a step behind him. Here they are, the old tramp yelled as Caleb pushed past him. Excuse me, said Caleb politely. Up here, shouted the tramp. But we didn't stop to find out how fast his friends came up from the cellar. We lit out of there without taking time for a backward look. 
I dodged into a clump of hickory scrub and was just beginning to wonder where the lane was going when somebody grabbed me from behind and pinned my arms up behind me. Two more somebodies came out of the bushes in front of me. If I'd had a weak heart, I'd just be a name on a tombstone right now. Somebody stuck their faces up next to mine. Death to the bird dogs, it said, and I recognized our chief assassin, Myron Webster. You guys sure took long enough, said Clint, who was right behind Myron. We almost froze out here waiting to scare you. Did that scarecrow get you? And how'd you get in without us seeing you? Just then, Dink crashed in on top of us. By then, I'd almost caught my breath. Tramps, I managed to say. Tramps back there in the house. They're after us. Huh? frowned Myron. That's right, puffed Dink. Who's this? Clint demanded, hauling Caleb into a patch of moonlight by one ear. Me and Dink just looked at each other. Caleb smiled weakly. That's my little brother Caleb, I apologized. How do, said Caleb. What's he doing here, Myron wanted to know. He followed us, I explained. He won't tell. Where's Amos, Clint suddenly interrupted. We all looked at each other and realized that Clint was right. Amos was missing. Clint sized up the situation pretty fast, but then he's in eighth grade. Come on, boys, get some rocks and let's go, he ordered. Me and Dink and Caleb hooked onto the end of the gang. There must have been fifteen or twenty of us six, nine, three, four, oh, twos. Our right fist to the blood of our enemy, our left fist to eternal victory, we shouted. And then we made a wild rebel attack on the old Stapleton house. Amos was still nowhere in sight. The fat tramp started to run for the woods, and Dink caught him right about the middle of the shin bone with a rock the size of a plum. That tramp could sure swear. When they saw how badly they were outnumbered, the tramps kind of gave up and waited out in front of the porch. Caleb started handing out rocks. He had a whole armload of them. What'd you do with the other kid that was in there? Clint demanded from about twenty-five feet out. The one they had called Harry spit in the frosty glass. What other kid? He said. You know what other kid, said Clint. It was just being able to say things like that that made him holy president of our club. I never saw nobody else, said Harry. Well, you better find him fast, mister, or you're going to be wearing this rock, said Clint. <laughs> you got a big mouth, don't you, kid? Yeah, and I got about 16 other big mouths right behind me. You find that other boy, or you're never going to see another freight train again. The tramps looked at each other a little bit worried. Dink picked up a new rock, and the fat tramp backed off a step or two. Get me out of here, said a voice from the darkness. That was Amos, I said. Where are you, yelled Myron. Down here under the porch, I fell through and bent my ankle. As we came up to the house, the tramps faded quietly into the woods, and we never saw them around Harleyville again. Amos's ankle wasn't hurt bad, and we all made it back to town without getting caught by parents or anybody. The proud members of 693402 began to separate and sneak back to their own homes. Finally, there were just us bird dogs and Caleb and Clint Harker left. We didn't get the nest, Dink admitted to Clint. And Caleb followed us, convinced Amos. Confessed Amos. So I guess we won't get to be hounds, huh? I asked Clint. Oh, I don't know, he said. You conducted yourselves bravely. You found us some enemies. I think the club will vote to let you be hounds. Dink and Amos and I looked at each other and smiled proudly. Besides, Clint went on, it looks like we've got us a new bird dog. He looked at Caleb. Hot dog, exclaimed Caleb. Me and Dink and Amos looked at Caleb and smiled again.